Daniel John Patrick Danny Green November 14, 1933 to October 6, 1977 was an Irish-American mobster and associate of Cleveland mobster John Nardi during the gang war for the city's criminal operations during the 1970s. Competing gangsters set off more than 35 bombs, most attached to cars in murder attempts, many successful. Green had gained power first in a local chapter of the International Longshoremen's Association, where he was elected president in the early 1960s. Green pushed into Cleveland rackets and began competing with the Italian-American Mafia for control of the city. He set up his own group called the Celtic Club, complete with enforcers. Early life and education Danny Green was born in Cleveland, to parents John Henry Green and Irene Cecilia Green nay Fallon. His father was born in Cleveland, Ohio, but his mother was born in Pennsylvania. Three days after his birth, Green's mother died. He was called, Baby Green. Until his mother was buried, and was eventually named after his grandfather, Daniel John Green. His father drank heavily and eventually lost his job as a salesman for Fuller Brush. After this, Danny temporarily moved in with his grandfather, a newspaper printer, who had also been recently widowed. Unable to provide for him, Danny's father placed him in Palmerdale, a Roman Catholic orphanage in Palmer, Ohio, three miles outside Cleveland. In 1939 Danny's father began dating a nurse and married her. They started their own family and brought Danny home. At age six, he resented his stepmother and ran away on several occasions. His paternal grandfather took him in, and Danny lived with him and an aunt for the rest of his childhood in the Collinwood neighborhood. Danny's grandfather worked nights, so he was able to roam the streets at night. When his father died in 1959, the newspaper obituary listed his children from his second marriage, but didn't mention Danny. At St. Jerome Catholic School, Danny developed a great fondness for the nuns and priests. He developed a lasting friendship with some of his teachers and served as an altar boy. An athletic boy, he excelled at baseball and was an all-star basketball player. Although Green was a poor student, the nuns at St. Jerome let him play sports because he was valuable for the team. Green attended St. Ignatius High School. In frequent fights with Italian-American students, children of more recent immigrants struggling for place, Danny developed an intense dislike for Italians that lasted his entire life. After being expelled from St. Ignatius, he transferred to Collinwood High School, where he excelled in athletics. A boy scout for a short time, he was kicked out of his troop. He was expelled from Collinwood High School due to excessive tardiness, which he claimed was caused by the bullying of fellow students. Topic. Personality. As an adult, Green stood 5 feet 10 inches and was self-conscious about his personal appearance. He pursued physical fitness, lifting weights and jogging. As he became older, he quit smoking and drinking, and had a hair prosthesis. He followed a rigid diet of fish, vegetables and vitamin supplements. Green was a devoted animal lover and owned two pet dogs. He had a habit of putting out food for the birds and squirrels. While some claim Green privately disliked Italians, nonetheless, he collaborated with many Italian Americans in business and criminal interests. <laughs> <laughs> Military service Expelled from high school in 1951, Green enlisted in the United States Marines, where he was soon noticed for his abilities as a boxer and marksman. He was stationed at Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune, Jacksonville, North Carolina. He was transferred many times, possibly because of behavioral issues. 
Promoted to the rank of corporal in 1953, Green taught new junior Marines how to be artillerymen. He was honorably discharged later that year. Topic: <laughs> Waterfront. In the early 1960s, Green worked steadily as a longshoreman at the Cleveland Docks years before the work was unionized by the International Longshoremen's Association In his free time he read about Ireland and its turbulent history. He began to think of himself as a Celtic warrior. Some writers have speculated that reading about such warriors inspired his criminal ambitions. In 1961, the president of the local union was removed from office by the ELA and Green was chosen to serve as interim president. He handily won the next election. Once president, Green had the union office painted green to represent his Irish ethnicity and installed thick green carpeting. He was known to drive a green car, wear green jackets, and often handed out green ink pens. In office, he raised dues 25% and pushed workers to perform volunteer hours to assist in providing a building fund. Those who refused often found themselves losing work. He fired more than 50 members while denouncing them as winos and bums to other workers. Green led sometimes violent protests and strikes to force the stevedore companies to allow the ELA to oversee the hiring of dock workers. As a prerequisite to landing a job as a longshoreman, many workers had to unload grain from the ships on a temporary basis and turn their paychecks over to Green. Said to have been collected to build a union hall, most of the funds ended up in Green's personal bank account. An unidentified ELA member would later recall about Green. He read on the waterfront. He imagined himself a tough dot boss. But he was 30 years too late. He used workers to beat up union members who did not come in line, but he was never seen fighting himself. He was a spellbinding speaker and a good organizer. As a union organizer, Green sometimes declared work stoppages, as frequently as 25 per days, to demonstrate to company owners his authority on the docks. On one occasion, he threatened to murder the two children of one owner. The FBI put the man's house and family under protection. After Sam Marshall, an investigative reporter, collected affidavits that supported charges of extortion, Green was exiled from the Union and convicted of embezzlement. The conviction was later overturned on appeal. Rather than face a second trial, he pleaded guilty to the lesser charge of falsifying Union records, was fined $10,000 and received a suspended sentence. Afterward, he did not pay the fine or receive any prison time. After returning to his rackets, Green met and befriended Teamsters boss Louis Triscaro. He introduced Green to Jimmy Hoffa. After the friendly meeting, Hoffa later reportedly said to Triscaro, Stay away from that guy. There's something wrong with him. Marty McCann of the Organized Crime Division of the FBI recruited Green as an informant. He became a top echelon confidential informant. Green passed along information to the FBI, but only that which suited his personal needs and would not hurt those close to him. His codename was, Mr. Patrick, a reflection on his Irish pride. It was his confirmation name and that of his beloved Irish saint. Protected by his informant status, Green increased his criminal activities. By 1964, the members of the union were fed up with Green's behavior. The Plain Dealer began writing a nine-part investigative series about him. The series brought Green unwanted attention from the U.S. Attorney, the Internal Revenue Service, the Labor Department, and the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor. The ELA began its own investigation and soon removed Green from office. Eventually, Green was convicted in federal court of embezzling $11,500 in union funds as well as two counts of falsifying records. The verdict was overturned by an appeals court, and federal prosecutors finally settled for Green's guilty plea to two misdemeanor charges. 
he was fined $10,000, but paid only a fraction of it. Some think that his FBI connections worked to lessen his punishment. Topic: Criminal career. Green started working for the Cleveland Solid Waste Trade Guild, where he was hired to keep the peace. Impressed with his abilities, mobster Alex Shondor Burns hired him as an enforcer for his various numbers operators. The Cleveland family underboss Frank Little Frank. Brancato, used Green and other Irish-American gangsters to act as errand boys and as muscle to enforce the Mafia's influence during the 1960s over the garbage hauling contracts and other rackets. Until his death in 1973, Brancato reportedly regretted bringing Green into the mob due to the damage Green did. In May 1968, under Burns's orders, Green was supposed to attack a black numbers man who was holding out on protection money due. Unfamiliar with the military-type detonator, Green barely made it out of his car before the bomb exploded. He told the police a story and survived being thrown nearly 20 feet, although the hearing in his right ear was damaged for life. In the future, Green would only trust professionals to handle bombs for him. Mike, Big Mike, Fratto broke away from the guild and founded the more legitimate trade group called the Cuyahoga County Refuse Haulers Association. A legitimate businessman, he protested Green bringing mob involvement and strong arm tactics to the guild, although he had his own connections. The Cleveland Solid Waste Trade Guild fell apart shortly thereafter. In 1971, Fratto's car was destroyed by a bomb. Inside was found an accomplice of Green named Art Sneperger. Sneperger had allegedly been careless with the bomb he was planting, and Fratto was across the street. The previous September, Green had directed Sneperger to fix a bomb on Fratto's car, but Sneperger had second thoughts and informed Fratto of Green's plan. Sneperger had also been a police informant and revealed everything to Sergeant Edward Kovacic, of the Cleveland Police Intelligence Unit, including Green's status as a top echelon FBI informant. Some investigators believed the explosion was an accident caused by a radio signal, possibly from a short-wave radio or a passing police car. Others posited that Burns and Green arranged Snepperger's death after learning of his informant status. Sergeant. Kovacic was told by an underworld source that Green had pushed the detonator, killing Snepperger instantly. The case was never officially solved. On November 26, 1971, Fratto was shot and killed at Cleveland's White City Beach. Green was arrested and interrogated. He admitted to the killing but claimed self-defense. He said Fratto had fired three shots while Green was jogging and exercising his dogs, and he fired one back. Evidence seemed to corroborate Green's story and he was released. Cleveland police later learned Fratto was armed and had an opportunity to kill Green several weeks prior to the White Beach shooting. During their partnership, Green and Fratto had become so close that they had named sons after each other. Not long afterward, Green again found himself a target while jogging in White City Beach. A sniper, concealed several hundred feet away, fired several shots at Green from a rifle. Instead of ducking to the ground, Green pulled out his revolver and started shooting, while running toward his would-be assassin. The sniper fled and was never positively identified. Investigators learned that this attempt was part of a murder contract left by Burns. Green left his wife and the three children for their own safety and moved to Collinwood, where he rented an apartment. Journalist Ned Whelan wrote about Green. Imagining himself as a feudal baron, he supported a number of destitute Collinwood families, paid tuition to Catholic schools for various children and, like the gangsters of the twenties, actually had 50-20 pound turkeys delivered to needy households on Thanksgiving. He often picked up restaurant tabs for friends, neighbors, and acquaintances, and left generous tips. 
Green evicted a bookmaker who operated out of a small Waterloo business, and kept a local bar in order by personal visits. When a rowdy group of Hell's Angels moved into Collinwood, Green visited their headquarters with a stick of dynamite. He threatened to light it and throw it into the club house until they came out to hear his warning to keep things quiet while in Collinwood. Topic, the Celtic Club. He formed his own crew of young Irish-American gangsters, called the Celtic Club. His main enforcers were Keith Ritson, Kevin McTaggart, Brian O'Donnell, Danny Green Jr. and Billy McDuffie, who set up gambling dens across the city. He also allied with John Nardi, a Cleveland family labor racketeer who wanted to overthrow the leadership. The relationship between Green and Burns began to sour. Green had asked Burns for a loan of $75,000 to set up a cheat spot, a speakeasy and gambling house. Burns arranged for it through the Gambino crime family. The money was lost in the hands of Burns's courier Billy Cox, who purchased cocaine. The police raided his house, arrested him, seized the narcotics and what was left of the $75,000. The Gambino family wanted their money. Burns pressed Green, who flatly refused to return it, reminding him that he couldn't return something he never received and that Burns's courier had lost it. To settle the dispute, Burns directed an associate to hire a hitman for Green and gave him $25,000 for the job, especially in the event of any harm befalling him. Several minor underworld characters, burglars by trade, took the contract, but made numerous failed assassination attempts on Green. Not long after, Green found an unexploded bomb in his car when he pulled into a Collinwood service station for gas. The explosive was wired improperly and failed to detonate. Green disassembled the bomb himself, removed the dynamite, and brought the rest of the package to a policeman, Edward Kovacic. Kovacic offered him police protection, but he refused. He refused to hand over the bomb, telling him, I'm going to send this back to the old bastard that sent it to me. Suspecting that Burns was behind it, Green decided to retaliate. On March 29, 1975, Holy Saturday, the eve of Easter, Burns was blown up by a bomb containing C-4, a potent military explosive, in the lot behind Christie's Lounge, the former Jack and Jill West Lounge, a go-go spot at 2516 Detroit Avenue near St. Malachi's Church. On May 12, an explosion rocked Collinwood. Green's building was destroyed, but the man had only minor injuries. As the second floor fell, he was shielded from the debris by a refrigerator that had lodged against a wall. A second, more powerful, bomb failed to explode, for which Green credited the intercession of St. Jude, whose medal he always wore around his neck. In 1975, Green began to push into the vending machine racket, traditionally controlled by the Mafia, as well as muscling into gambling operations. The Cleveland family leadership was angry, especially the soldier Thomas the Chinaman Sinito. He thought Green was an extortionist, due to the excessive fees he charged for coin-operated laundry contracts. Green controlled some of the more lucrative laundry contracts that Sinito wanted. Sinito and mob soldier Joseph Joey Luce Yakabachi murdered one of Green's associates. Green had dynamite wired to the frame of Sinito's car, but Sinito found the bomb, removed and disarmed it, and later destroyed it. In Green's competition with the Mafia to build a vending machine empire, John Conte became a victim. Conte owned a vending machine company, but worked as a root man for another one. His company provided slot machines to various private clubs and parties. Conte was also a close friend of Joseph Gallo. On the day of his disappearance, Conte told his wife he had a meeting with Green. That was the last time she saw him, as his badly beaten corpse was discovered a few days later at a dump site in Austintown. Police investigators theorized that Conte was beaten to death in Green's trailer and his body later transported to Austintown. They found some physical evidence, but Green was never charged with Conte's murder. 
In 1976, longtime mobster John Scalish died, leaving control of Cleveland's lucrative criminal operations, specifically the city's Teamsters Union locals, up for grabs. Scalish had appointed James Litsarvoli as his successor, but other mobsters such as John Nardi challenged him for leadership of the organization. With the assistance of Green, within weeks Nardi had many of Litsarvoli's supporters killed. They included Litsarvoli's underboss, Leo Lips Moseri, the Cleveland family's enforcer, Eugene the Animal. Siasullo, was seriously injured and sidelined for several months by a car bomb. Soon after, a bomb planted in Alfred Alley Calabrese's car killed an innocent man. Frank Perchio, of Collinwood, died while moving Calabrese's Lincoln Continental before getting his own car out of their shared driveway. This began a long-standing war between Litsarvoli's Cleveland crime family and Green's Celtic Club. In 1976 alone, 36 bombs exploded around the Cleveland area, which was soon given the moniker, Bomb City, USA. The ATF tripled its staffing in Northeast Ohio in order to handle the bomb investigations. A suspected bombmaker, Martin Heitman, was arrested, but was released for lack of evidence. According to To Kill the Irishman by Rick Perello, Green killed at least eight of the Mafia hit men sent to assassinate him, using bombs or bullets. <laughs> Final days <laughs> Media personality After the failed Waterloo Avenue bombing, Green played up the stories of the Mafia's failed assassination attempts to his benefit. His bravado and flamboyant behavior only added to his growing aura of invincibility and power in the urban legends of the Cleveland criminal underworld. He granted interviews to local television stations. For a newspaper photographer, he posed proudly in front of a boarded-up window of his destroyed apartment building. During a televised interview, Green said to one television reporter, The luck of the Irish is with me and I have a message for those yellow maggots. That includes the payers and the doers. The doers are the people who carried out the bombing. They have to be eliminated because the people who paid them can't afford to have them remain alive. And the payers are going to feel great heat from the FBI and the local authorities. And let me clear something else up. I didn't run away from the explosion. Someone said they saw me running away. I walked away. In response to the reporter's assertion that, like a cat, Green had nine lives, Green said, I am an Irish Catholic. I believe that the guy upstairs pulls the strings, and you're not going to go until he says so. It just wasn't my time yet. In another televised interview, he denied any knowledge of the underworld war. He said, I have no axe to grind, but if these maggots in this so-called mafia want to come after me, I'm over here by the Celtic Club. I'm not hard to find. <laughs> Assassination On May 17, 1977, Green's longtime ally John Nardi was killed by a bomb, planted by Pasquale Cisternino and Ronald Carabia. After Nardi was murdered, a mafia boss, James Litsarvoli, arranged a ceasefire with Green, hoping to kill the other man off guard. Shortly after their meeting, Green muscled in on a large West Side gambling operation originally run by Nardi. Green offered Litsarvoli a percentage, but it was declined. On October 6, 1977, Green went to a dental appointment at the Brainard Place office building in Lindhurst, Ohio. Members of the Mafia had tapped his phone and were aware of the visit. After Green visited a dentist and left the office building, he approached his car. 
The automobile parked next to his exploded, killing Green instantly. The car bomb was believed to have been planted by a hitman known as Ray Ferrito. Green's remains were cremated on October 8, 1977, and he was buried at Calvary Cemetery in Cleveland. Aftermath In the aftermath of Danny Green's murder, his hitman Ray Ferrito was arrested by Cleveland police, and subsequently was targeted by Litsarvoli. Ferrito surrendered himself to the Federal Bureau of Investigation and struck a deal in order to gain protection. This all led to the Mafia Commission trial, which put Mafia families from all over the United States, especially all of New York's five families, the Gambino crime family, the Genovese crime family, the Colombo crime family, the Lucchese crime family, the Bonanno crime family, on trial. This trial practically ended the existence of the Cleveland Mafia. In popular culture In 1998, Rick Perello, a former Cleveland area police lieutenant, wrote To Kill the Irishman, The War That Crippled the Mafia 1998, about Green's engagement with the Mafia. He won a National Nonfiction Award for the book. It was adapted as a movie first entitled The Irishman, The Legend of Danny Green. In 2011, the biopic Kill the Irishman, which loosely chronicles Green's life, was released to favorable reviews. It was directed by Jonathan Hensley and starred Ray Stevenson as Green. The season 11 episode Brothers Keeper of Law and Order is based on his case. <laughs>